party people out there in I almost said video game land again. We shouldn't say that. I chastised myself for saying that last time. And here I am doing that shit again. And I, But I'm not going to do that. You know who it is. It's your boy, Dre. And I'm here with a friend of mine. His name is Evan. Hello, everybody out there in the interwebs. Uh, I have to c- comment. I can't let this go that we're referencing the fact that this is essentially a second take. Um, it's very backstreet back energy. <laughs> like, no, don't tell everybody that. Okay, I'm they sorry. That was a they, secret. Oh my god, you, you don't know this. You don't know the secrets of recording. Yeah, this is no. This was all done live, one take. Everything's perfect. Nothing behind the curtain. <laughs> it's like it's like Maladroit, where they did like their tracks, and there's like no like cutting up of they did all their tracks in one take. You know what I mean? And pasted them the Pro Tools as that like live feel. That's what we're doing right now. Yeah, this is 2002. Absolutely. And we're going to, we'll make some sort of like pretentious statement in like the flavor text that'll talk about how, you know, really the beauty is in the imperfections. And, uh, <laughs> you know, this is really just capturing the live energy of the band. Like we're, like we're fucking making like, I don't know, a Maxwell record or something. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Anyway. So man, it's been wild with this, with the Spotify business, huh? Oh God. Yeah. I, uh, saw this on Twitter start to explode all of a sudden and emails coming in from, you know, I, I read the old curmudgeon Bob left sets is, you know, music industry, you know, zine, zine, whatever, whatever. Is it, it's zine like magazine. You know what? I've never said that word out loud. Yeah. So I guess like Dick, <laughs> like logic would dictate that it's zine, but I've never bothered to say it. I've only read it. Yeah, and it was one of those words that was always popping up like in like Newsweek articles about like these are the new things that kids are doing in the 90s, you know? And so you'd see like, "Ooh, you know, they have these like DIY zines, zines." So I'd always read about it, but I never heard somebody in real life actually use that word. Is that the first time you've ever said it? Surely it is because yes, you just absolutely. had that consternation. Yeah. Yeah, it's just right. like, "Shit, how do you say this?" Yeah. What did he? Well, actually, this is one of the few times I'm actually interested in what that braying dinosaur had to say. What did What did he actually have to say about this stuff? Yeah, um, yeah. Left sets his uh, position was kind of interesting. Um, you know, basically, uh, kind of talking about uh, you know Daniel Elk or the CEO of Spotify uh, and how basically Spotify gives something like seventy percent of revenue to rights holders. Um, but that basically the, um, the economics of this was that there was not a lot of differentiation across each of these platforms in terms of actual product, right? Like the music catalog is roughly the same between Spotify, Tidal, Apple Music, etc. So Daniel Elk basically kind of uh, read the room on that and realized that it was being boxed out of being able to make deals with hardware makers. Um, in terms of getting Spotify integration into different areas. So it read the table on that and said, okay, we need something that's really going to differentiate ourselves. So it went really in on podcasting. Um, And so that's what gave Joe Rogan such a huge paycheck. And that's what gave Joe Rogan that sort of power. And it's also why they're unwilling to just be like, you know, fuck this guy, let's boot him off. Like they would typically, like he also cites Morgan Wallen, you know, the country artist who, you know, was caught drunkenly saying the N-bomb, you know, how he got the hammer dropped on him because he didn't have that sort of power. He was basically merely a music artist. Isn't that, I I thought you were going to go with that, um, that Eagles wide receiver, that white guy, the only white, 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 wide receiver in the league who was like saying like, I'll fight every bleepity bleep here at this at this concert. And I'm like, bro, there ain't no bleepity bleeps here. I mean, I dare you to find one. If you can find one, you can fight him or her. Um, <laughs> or, or with another man. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, did I just or with another man? <laughs> um, yeah. So, like, it's wild, right? So, like, but here's the thing, though. For me, Obviously, like the least interesting part about this is Joe Rogan. Like, I mean, that's to because, you know, like it's so obvious, right? Like, I'm not going to have any nuance about that that nobody has ever thought of or doesn't already know. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like I that's sort of topped out. It's like, you know exactly what this is. You know what time it is, right? Like, mm-hmm. you really got to explain it. So the genesis of this 
is I I made a tweet because a couple of tweets and I asked what you thought about it. I guess I'll just sniff my own farts real quick and just read them verbatim. So, mm. so just so everyone has context. So here's here's what I wrote on Twitter. Just an observation about the Spotify thing. The relative lack of protest music in the 21st century was and always has been shocking. Neil Young did Living With War in 2006 about the W administration and the Iraq war. Why was it Neil Young? Because nobody else was doing it. I thought Trump would open the protest music floodgate, and it didn't. We just don't do it like that anymore. So it doesn't surprise me that it's only the old guard like Neil Young and Joni Mitchell giving Spotify ultimatums. They're the only ones who are going to. And I hope I'm wrong. So, like, I asked you what you thought about that, and let's just go through that here. Like, what was your general thought about what I said? Absolutely. First of all, I love the uh, the overview. It feels very, like, you know, AP exam prompt, you know, like for your <laughs> essay. Like, got my Thank little you. number two pencil that I'm sharpening and hoping it doesn't turn into a nub. <laughs> I'm a I'm a pen guy. I'm I go for it. I I'm a, I'm like a one and done. If I have to erase something, like oh well, I gotta. You're committed. I like the pen. Yeah, I'm committed. I'm committed on the. I don't do the pencil. I got to do the pen unless I have to do the pencil. Of course, it's it's mandated, right? But like, yeah. If I if I don't have to, I won't. Yeah, if it's a scantron on your toes, but you know, when, yeah. <laughs> when, when it comes to this, uh, you know, the, the the lack of protest music in the 21st century. Uh, it is kind of shocking. I think we all, you know, in our generation, you know, I'm 36 and you're like, you know, 87. I'm going to be whatever. 40 in a few months here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 40. Same thing, basically. Um, mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, in, in our world, you know, my mom was born in, you know, 1952. So she's going to turn 70 this year. So I was absolutely regaled with tales from the 60s, you know, 60s protest music. Uh, and, and my mom grew up, you know, raised me with that music. You know, hearing like, you know, uh, Barry Maguire's like Eve of Destruction and stuff like that, um, you know, and so so I come up with that music um, very much in the space of, of hearing about how protest music changed the world. And so when things started really going sideways um, post 9-11, I very much expected that we would get that, especially since it seemed like there were rumblings of that with, you know, Rage Against the Machine you know, pre 9-11 with the Battle of Los Angeles and stuff like that. It seemed like we might have a moment. Um, Isn't it know. kind of radical that it, like, in retrospect, that Rage did that shit in the Clinton era? Yeah. It's kind of wild, isn't it? Right? Yeah. You know, I remember them, uh, the you know, the 2000s, you know, the, the, the 2000, literally the year 2000 at the, uh, you know, the DNC, you know, right? The big, they played the big yeah. concert, you know, right, right. there. And that, yeah. that's pre 9-11. It, yeah, mm-hmm. it is weird to think about that. Um, and it's weird to think about how Rage got really quiet after Bush. Like, you know, they kind of. Well, they, they broke up. Yeah, basically. they broke up so and they didn't like, really, I mean, you know. You know, yeah, we had Audio Slave, but Chris Cornell was not that dude, at least not on record. You know what I mean? That's just not what he writes about. And I remember him saying, I remember like a Rolling Stone article of it, like him saying to the band, like, no politics, like straight up. That's just not, it's not that I'm not political. That's just not what I write about. So that is not my lyrics. That is not my voice on record. So I'm not going to do that, you know? And they're like, okay, you know, obviously they were still very actively politically, especially Tom Morello. Right. So, but like, and, and of course, Chris Cornell has his own views, right? Had his own views, but like, you know, it just didn't come out of him. No, that's part of it too, though, isn't it? Maybe I think mean, maybe we don't have that kind of music because that's not where artists are at anymore. It does not come out of them that way. Yeah, that's a really interesting thing that I, I think you know it's kind of coming to me right now. Thinking about this, um, you know, you think about who you know the generational divide in terms of who's making the popular art of the day, right? Um, you know, you think about and, and who the market is. The market's often the kids. Right. So you got your, you know, people that are, you know, 10 to 22 or whatever that maybe is your market. And then a lot of the people who are making the music are about 10 to 15 years above that age range, mm-hmm. which, uh, you know, if we, if we call, you know, somebody like myself at, you know, 36 years old, born in 1985, if you call me a sort of elder millennial, if you will, um, then the people who were talking about that were making music were pretty firmly in Gen X, um, the generation that's sort of known for, 
you know, kind of being like the the slacker generation, the ones that are sort of disaffected, you know, sandwiched between the baby boomers and the millennials who are just kind of sort of ignored, you know, kind of the latchkey kids who just, you know, didn't really have that that energy, the sort of like, you know, kind of Daria-esque, like, well, I'm just kind of whatever, man. Yeah, but you think about that generation and what do you want to say? You could say maybe like, REM is a little more like firmly like baby boomer, but like, even if you want to include them, uh, like, or Pearl Jam or like cake or any of those, all these bands are like fucking super liberal, right? Mm -hmm. Like, it's not like, it's not like Gen X didn't have its like, oh, we're so, I don't know. You ever hear those like, um, fucking fake ass conservatives who are like, they made me racist because of X, Y, or Z, you know, like that type of shit. You know what I mean? Like I, I'm, I'm, I assume some Gen Xers do that, but you know what the fuck I'm trying to say? Like it's, you know, yeah, that type of that type of shit. But if you think about it, a lot of those bands are pretty squarely big lefties. So yeah, yeah, definitely liberal. Um, but at the same time, you know, not as willing to like, I think in some ways speak up about it. And you know what? I, I think some of that probably has to come from is this feeling of like of shift uh, away from like, you know, these solid liberal presidencies of, you know, the, the sixties, you know, you get JFK, you get Jimmy Carter, you know, you, you know, you get some of these, these liberal presidents. And then we all of a sudden shift into um, this Republican thing uh, in the eighties, you get the Reagan years and, you know, you think about Gen X kind of coming up, you know, sort of into that, and there has to be a level of feeling disaffected where everybody, you know, the baby boomers, um, sort of their parents, you get this vibe of like, oh, cool, you're selling out and becoming these yuppies who traded in your 60s principles for, you know, your like luxury SUVs or whatever. There has to be this feeling of just like, man, well, fuck this. Like you're sort of absentee as parents getting divorced left and right. Does, does our political voice even really fucking matter? Like, yeah, maybe not so much. Like, you know, we'll just keep our head down and, you know, we'll feel what we feel, but are we going to really be the ones who are like bringing it to the man? Like in the sixties, maybe not so much. That's it's who- also like, it's also like not necessary because, well, not, not necessary, but less necessary because, um, you know, what's the, I mean, the thing looming over that was Vietnam. Mm -hmm. You know, so like, yeah, we don't have that. We don't have that anymore. You know, I I think that's another huge thing kind of tying that back, you know, to like, you know, our parents era, like our parents being in that baby boomer era, um, you know, Vietnam gave everybody skin in the game, you know, and I think that that can't be underestimated when it comes to the rise of counterculture movements. Because if literally every every male of draft age eligibility can be sent to a country thousands of miles away to die for a war, you know, geopolitical crisis, they may have no understanding what even like what's going on. If that's going on all around you and your buddies are getting shipped off there, you very much have a, a you know a stake in that outcome. You're gonna be you know upset about that. Even the even the prospect of that though can really get people's gears moving. Like, look, when nine eleven happened, I was nineteen, right? Mm-hmm. Like, people don't really remember it now. There was a little bit of draft talk. Now, obviously, it didn't happen, but that kind of talk was happening. Oh, if we go to Iraq, oh, if we and we did. Oh, if we go to this, oh, if we start doing that. I'm nineteen fucking years old, man. I'm not. I, that was definitely on my mind. Like you're younger than me, so you were kind of out of that. Like, but I, I sure was right there. So that was real. Just the prospect of it, let alone it actually happening in our country before we were born. I mean, that's wild to me. I just can't even imagine. So, absolutely. But you know, we we did have the you know the uh, you know I guess first Iraq War, if you will. You know, Desert Storm, and you know that was also volunteer. You know, that wasn't a draft for that. And so, you know, I. And we had such, you know, rah-rah jingoism post 9-11, 
you know, everybody was lining up to sign up to, you know, to fight that was really interesting. Oh my God. That was so performative. Like that was so ridiculous. Sometimes (laughs) it was like, oh yeah, I'm going to go right down to the army office and sign up right now. Like everybody, every macho idiot was trying to do that. You remember that shit? It was so stupid. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, but that was the world we were living in. But I do kind of remember that. I mean, in 2001, you know, I would have been like, what, 16, 15, 16 in that age. So yeah, definitely coming up on that, that age myself. So I remember kind of thinking about it. But I also remember thinking that, um, you know, it, it's the interesting thing about the draft is that, you know, politically, um, it gets you, it gets you the asses in chairs, so to speak, or you know the the feet in the boots. But it doesn't mm-hmm. really like it, it, it's not free. There's a huge political cost to that, uh, as our government learned in Vietnam. So, um, and there's a lot more accountability. There's a lot more eyes on what you're doing. And I think you know the government realized, or the people in power, a lot of the same people who were involved in the Reagan administration, uh, as well as the Bush one administration, like Dick Cheney and stuff like that. Um, those goons had to have realized that if you don't have that draft situation, you can pretty much get away with whatever you want. Like there's not actually going to be meaningful accountability in this country. And that's why it'll never come back. We will never have it again. There's just no way in this kind of society. We, we could have maybe gotten away with it to a somewhat degree in 2001, two, three, we can never do it now in 2022. I just can't see it. Oh yeah, I think we actually would have civil war if we did that. Like, yeah, the country no would just explode. There's just no way. No, no. But it also that's really influenced the the, the landscape of protest music, though, too. Because without without that prospect, it's just too easy for people to tune out and to say, you know, I mean, one, you don't have the volume of people that are involved. You know, you you think about was it something like fifty thousand people died? you know, in Vietnam, you know, died in the Vietnam War, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and that's over roughly a decade. I actually didn't even know it was that many people to the truth. Wow. Yeah, yeah. But it's over the course of a decade, right? But then you think about all the people, you know, everybody who went to Vietnam did not die, obviously. So you think about all the people that actually went to Vietnam versus the amount of people who died, right? And so you think about that. I, I don't have the numbers on how many people actually went but let's say we were talking about half a million, you know, combat troops, you know, in Vietnam over the course of that 10 year period, let's say. I don't think that would be unreasonable um, or quite possibly more than that. In fact, that wouldn't surprise me either. Um, with that many people, you're going to know somebody. Everybody knew somebody that went to Vietnam. Mm-hmm. I, you know, and I, I guess if I stretch, I can find people. I've definitely met people that were, you know, in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um but they're pretty few and far between. And there's definitely that vibe of like, well, I mean, you did opt into this. Like, you know, you signed up, you, you know, and, and past a certain point, you, you know, people who had signed up to join the military in 1999, 1998, you know, they had no idea what was coming in 2001. But if you signed up, you know, for the military in 2002, 2003, oh, 2005. Oh, you know exactly what you, you want know. to go do. Right? Yeah, you yeah. knew you were entering the war on terrorism, you know. Because Toby Keith told you to on one of the shitty records that he made, like, millions <laughs> yeah. of. I mean, like, right? So. Yeah, you knew you were signing up to be the uh, you know, the boot in their ass, you know, so to speak. But, like, think about – um Like my mom was born like 1959, right? So she's like a kind of a really kind of a late boomer, but she's like pretty squarely a boomer, just like in in terms of her mindset or whatever. And like, think of other people like, um, I don't know, Prince or like Rick James or whatever, who like fit into that like same like um, age category. They had songs that were, I mean, Prince has like, you know, God, I mean, what's 1999 about if not like nuclear fallout? right set mm-hmm. to a very happy cheery uh, tone right or ronnie talk to russia or or party up the last song on a uh, dirty mind mm-hmm. uh i mean he's had he's had songs like that like and i don't think it's any coincidence so i was talking about this with another friend recently i think um prince was on snl and i think like early 81 or something so it was like still like dirty mind era he play he didn't go on there and play the title track or you know uptown or god forbid head on live on tv <laughs> he played <laughs> he played party up and mm-hmm. i feel like he did that for a reason you know mm-hmm. i really don't think we have anything like that and if we did it would be trump 
we didn't really hear any big time anti-Trump records, did we? Like, I mean, I thought, I tell you what, I really thought we would. Like, okay, I forget what award show this was. It was like really early 2017. I forget whether it was like the Grammys or American Music Awards or something. Buster Rhymes was performing and he called him uh, President Agent Orange. <laughs> that's that's when that shit got started. You know, mm-hmm. that was like the first like celebrity or like music person to really say some shit like that because we knew it was coming. And it was just like, oh, shit. Right. And after I heard that, I was like, it's happening. The floodgates are opening. The floodgates never opened. Yeah. You know, I, I wonder, too. um, you know, we we talked a little bit about this, and I think it's worth kind of uh, kind of going back into. I I I think it's really easy if you're making art. You know, you, you can create this sort of feedback loop. You know, you think about live performance. If you if the song is really resonating, you get this live energy that builds, and like you know, it kind of you know brings the crowd in, and then it brings you more energy, and you perform even better, right? And I think you know, with your art, you know, if you're making these these awesome protest songs and it's really galvanizing people and you're getting great feedback on it, then you're going to probably do more of that. It's that marketing um, economics thing of like, if something's successful, it puts a signal out into the marketplace, sort of a supply and demand kind of a thing. And I think what we saw is we saw people who would do this, like, you know, you'd see, I think of uh, some examples, like uh, I think of Incubus's Megalomaniac, Yes. Um, you I know, was reminded of that song the other day. I totally forgot about it. Yeah. You know, I think of stuff like that. Um, you know, I know you've got some uh, examples too. Um, those, those songs go out there and like, you know, they're perfectly fine songs. They chart however they chart. Even relatively popular versions of these songs, um, they don't seem to create that galvanized movement around anything. At best, people kind of go, yeah, I like that. And so, and you don't see any movement of the needle, you know, there's no, and so I think as an artist, you're probably left going like, well, I did that and it was okay. And it was maybe received all right by my base. Like I probably didn't piss off, like Incubus didn't piss off a ton of fans, I doubt. Because they can't, they, at that point, what was that, 2004? Yeah. There's a crow left a murder, right? Mm-hmm. They can't yeah. just kept, they just can't come out and say like, it's about Bush. They, they saw what happened to the Dixie Chicks. They saw what happened to you know pearl jam caught fucking hell over bush leaguer on riot act that was 2002 that was like barely a year after 9 11 that's when you couldn't say nothing right like at all you couldn't say shit and look bush leaguer like isn't even that i don't know it's just kind of one of those weird little spoken word like if you really want to read into that much Sure. Yes, I know the song is called Bush Leaguer, but like, let's not act like he said like, I don't know. People, I the the rhetoric I heard was just like so negative, and it's just like we can't be talking like that right now. We have to, you know, whatever, roll around on the flag in our front lawn or whatever the fuck we were doing <laughs> at, yeah. at that time, right? Like, it was so, it was so crazy. It was such a crazy time. So oh, yeah. yeah, I don't blame like, I don't know. I'm trying to even think of a Franz Ferdinand for not, you know, who, who or whoever was debuting at that time to not come out. And, and yes, I know they're not American, but you know, you know what I'm trying to say, like coming out and saying like, Oh God, I better not, you know, I mean, they probably see that shit and it has an effect. I think yeah. that had weight. I think the, I mean, we talk about cancel culture. Now they canceled Ooh. the Dixie chicks, man. Yeah. They canceled Janet Jackson. Mm-hmm. Even yeah. though Justin Timberlake did it right, like we were, we were in a time. It was a time, absolutely. You know, and the the Dixie Chicks thing is really interesting because, um, you you can't take away from the impact of uh, the fact that the Dixie Chicks are a you know a, a band of of women, right? A country group mm-hmm. that is that is all women, and. You know, it's it's part of that had to very much be. I think we all kind of know that part of that is you know these these mouthy broads kind of vibe. You know what I mean? I not that if the, if it was a you know mm-hmm. a, a guy group, not if it was Garth Brooks, that Garth Brooks wouldn't have caught in some hell for that too, right? I think I think anybody that was country would have been viewed as a traitor in that sense because I, I I think that was what drove a lot of that. Obviously, that is exactly what happened. I'll tell you what because I remember reading a. 
again, at this time, I was reading a lot of Rolling Stone for some reason. It was like a weird, now I look back on it, that was like a weird solace during those times. I read a lot of Rolling Stone. I think I had a subscription even at that time. Just like those articles, like really just, it made me feel like, you know, the stuff I was seeing on the news and you watch TV and it's like, am I taking crazy pills or is this just not supposed to be this way? And I'm reading this magazine that was like sort of affirming like, okay, yeah, I, I someone else gets it too. Anyway, there was an article on them in Rolling Stone and they were interviewing uh, station programmers and they were talking, you know, these people were saying stuff like they turned their backs on country music and stuff like that. And I just thought that was crazy rhetoric. Now I know that it's basically just a, you know, a, do- a big old dog whistle, mm-hmm. but like, oh, absolutely. That was such crazy rhetoric to me. I just didn't expect to hear something like that. Read something like that. It, it, because like you just it doesn't take much to read between those lines, right? They turn their back on country music. What the fuck do you think that means? They turn their back on white people. Oh yeah, yeah. And I and I think that there's such a huge in group out group, you know, kind of dynamic, you know, a real like kind of uh, tribal dynamic that exists uh, in the right wing spheres, especially um, this sense of identity being tied to you know rural America, this sense of being tied to place. And like white, white America and white customs, um, you know, rooted in, in, you know, these shared experiences of like, you know, sort of Judeo-Christian small town white experiences. Um, like that's that's the, the sort of, I think, thought and ethos behind this. And so when you're perceived as going against that, you're perceived as, you know, essentially rejecting all of those things. You're rejecting mm-hmm. the whiteness, the Christianity you know, the nationalism, the love of country, the quote unquote, small town values, all of that stuff. And so it's seen as a personal attack on everybody's identity and group identity. In retrospect, though, I wonder what the Dixie Chicks were thinking, though, because surely going up in country music, you know, this shit already, Mm -hmm. especially as left leaning as they are, they really probably thought a lot of whatever goes on there is bullshit. So they just did they just not care? Did she just think saying that would just be okay? I wonder not that she shouldn't have said it. You know what I'm trying to say, though? I wonder, like, she's like, I don't care. I'm just going to set fire to this shit because, you know, like, I never thought about it from their perspective like that. Because yeah. my, my my reaction was always like, well, that's fucking bullshit, you know? But I wonder what how they thought, if they thought at all. Yeah. So, you know, getting the specifics of that, um, what my guess is on that, and I hadn't really thought about this until now either, um, you know, this all, the Dixie Chicks thing all started at a concert, you know, where I think, I think it was Natalie, Natalie Maines, yeah. you know, made a comment about, you know, like, you know, we're embarrassed that George Bush is from Texas, I believe mm-hmm. is what the comment was. That's exactly what she said. And, you know, I think about that and my guess would be, you know, think about when that comment came out, we didn't put ourselves in historical context, right? Like I remember the internet you know, sound like old man here, but I remember the internet kind of being, you know, starting to really become a thing. And like my first Hotmail account, all that stuff, 95, 96. <laughs> Hotmail. Right? So, so, so we put this in context. We're not that far in the early development of the internet here. And things like virality, things that we take for granted now with TikTok, you know, Twitter, memes, our sort of culture that we become immersed in over the last, you know, 15, 20 years. Right. But we go back into when Natalie made that comment, you still sort of lived in a world where maybe your comment gets picked up, you know, like it it, it makes the the local newspaper. But she probably had no expectation that this would go super viral at that point. Like we're also you got to keep in mind, we're in the pre cell phone cameras everywhere where everything's recorded. Right. So my guess is she gets on stage and she's just like fucking pissed off at this and is like, dude. Fuck this shit. I'm just going to say shit that I've been holding inside for a long time, thinking it's probably not going to go beyond that, like, amphitheater of people or whatever. But it does. I, I imagine they were just blown away. Yeah, you're right. The world got too small at that point, And she didn't realize that. Maybe she would have said it anyway. Like, we mm-hmm. don't we don't really know. Right. I'm just I'm just, we're just speculating. But, yeah, you're absolutely right about that. We got to the point where stuff could go viral. 
as much as they could in 2004, right? Oh boy, did it ever, too. <laughs> uh, I want to talk a little bit about, uh, speaking of 2004, I want to talk a little bit about American Idiot and um, REMs Around the Sun. But first, we're going to take a break. So we will be right back. On the Fine Time Radio, WXFT, 107.7. Reno. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I forgot about that. San Diego. They used to have those, like, really cheery, like, chorus voices. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, man. American Idiot. So, like, I'm not a big Green Day person. I really like Insomniac. It's like the only <laughs> I really like that record. Does that record have like a it has like brain stew, right? Or it has like a what, what's on Insomniac? Mm. You don't remember. This is a bad question. I Damn. was so yeah, this is a bad question only because I I became more Green Day acceptant later in life. I was I was one of those where like Billy Joe Armstrong's voice, I always felt like sort of a little little grading which i know i don't have no right to fucking say that given that i'm such a slut for billy corgan oh my so, like, god yeah i right. shouldn't really get to say a goddamn thing here but i just i was not super into billy joe armstrong as a, like a vocalist um even though i liked the hits on the radio and would never tr- change them i was never like i gotta get me a green day cd i was much more an offspring slut you know me, that's also like a one album wonder for me. I love Ixney on the Ombre. Otherwise, I am not listening to Offspring. Like, it's just not happening. Okay. Not even Smash? For, nah, that's eh, okay. American Idiot. Like, it's not a record I've listened to, like, a lot or anything. I never, like, had it. Well, now, think about that. Back then, that's when you had to, like, quote, unquote, have the album. <laughs> I didn't have it. Now we have everything, right? Um you know, look, the title track is obviously about W. Like, they went right at me, and as soon as this shit started, they went to the studio, and they were inspired by this shit. They didn't catch hell, though, right? Because, like, it didn't feel for a long time there, the Dixie Chicks, the Pearl Jam, everyone getting railroaded, the Clear Channel list, we'll talk about that a little bit if you want to, but, like, it's funny how they just didn't get kicked out of town for doing, I mean, it's called American Idiot. Like, what do you, I mean, (laughs) there's no subtlety there, right? Like you can't, they can't say, oh no, it's not. Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. But it was okay, right? Because it had the jams. It was fine. Everyone bought, everyone bought R. Kelly's Chocolate Factory, even though he was going through like a horrific lawsuit because it had the jams, right? Mm -hmm. I guess nobody cares if you, if you got the jams. Yeah, that's definitely a big piece of that. Um you know, I, I also think, you know, we're talking about Green Day, you know, they've always really, they've really leveraged the pop element of pop punk. Um, and also we, I think timing is really huge on this because we we got into the space with, you know, right after 9-11, as we've talked about, you know, Toby Keith and all the insanity of that. And, you know, Alan Jackson, you know, where were you the, when the world stopped turning? All the, you know. Oh, my God. I forgot about that one. Oh, my God. Yeah. So so we went real deep into that. But you remember, like, even if we take this beyond the scope of music, right? We remember uh, Freedom Fries, of oh, course. Yeah. You know, not French Fries, Freedom Fries. Yeah. And it, by the way, any of the kids who don't know what we're talking about, if you've heard, like, Brad Paisley's, like, accidental racist and thought that shit was hilarious, you need to go back and listen to some, like, 9-11 era, like – bullshit country music it is really funny like in a sad way it's really funny <laughs> oh God. yeah it's it's something man it's a history lesson that that shit should make the ap u.s history exams oh, like yeah. yes <laughs> good god but but you know you think about the the wider context right you're seeing this stupid shit like you know 
uh, you know, not French fries where, where you've got freedom fries and other, other nonsense like that, you know, because, you know, how dare France, you know, not be a hundred percent rah, rah America or whatever. In our, freedom toast. You know, yes, that's right. Freedom. Yeah. Toast. We use freedom toast that's, gets thrown under the bus. We remember freedom yeah. fries. Freedom toast doesn't that's quite right. get the same freedom play. Toast. Yeah. You know, exactly. <laughs> it's, it's yeah. So, so fucking stupid. And so as we get to when American idiot came out, um, that came out right before the 2004 election, which is, you know, when we're looking at, uh, you know, Bush's reelection, essentially, right? That's when he goes up against John Kerry. So, yeah. you know, a lot of people, I remember that I was, uh, you know, essentially a sophomore in college that year. And uh, I remember, like, there was a lot of disillusionment. A lot of people, I think, had started to see through all the rah-rah BS. People were kind of ticked off about that. You know, I think we all saw the people who would just slap on a little yellow ribbon onto their SUVs and feel really good about themselves with the support the troops stuff, but they didn't actually give a shit about ending the war or accomplishing a meaningful military objective or really seem, seeming to give a shit about the ben- actual benefits of the troops. You know, like what about their health benefits and actually taking care of them when they come back? Oh, so there no. were a lot we of still don't like, care about that. They still don't give a <laughs> shit about that, right? But but I think there were a lot of people who were starting to see through that and were like, okay, this is starting to get really fucking annoying. Um, and so I think it was the right time for American Idiot to hit, uh, especially pre-election as all of that was, you know, getting kind of riled up. You also have um, – In that, you also have a lot of Bush missteps along the way. So you got to keep in mind that like with the Bush presidency, even outside of the war, you know, was marked by all kinds of just super stupid moments in Mm -hmm. in bungled policy all the way down to like Hurricane Katrina, obviously, you know, you know, Kanye West, you know, famous comment there. When was that? What year was that? I'm like lost in time right now. Oh, 2006. Six, yeah, so that seems right. To me. Six, five, five, five. Yeah, it's like it's five. Really, it's like yeah. So, so definitely after the ele- the 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 election, but you know, but we'd still had a lot of bung- you know blunders, bungles, missteps, and so we, Green Day was really poised to make a statement here. I think they did, um, and so they captured that. But then also, I I feel like that they didn't just become sort of this one trick pony. Like it wasn't just protest song, protest song, protest song. They kind of alternated between, you know, the American idiot, which as you said, is very obviously political, but then they hit, you know, Boulevard of broken dreams. And so they go political, non-political, and then they do holiday. And then they do wake me up when September ends, you know, which I thinks about as, you know, dad dying of cancer, you know? So like we, we hit this, this alternating thing where, you know, people can come in and be like, yeah, you know, kind of, fuck this shit and then they can well, back out and go into that a pop was, space. that was always the trick right because like um rem's um around the sun around the sun came out after the election it came out in november 2004 i want to say like maybe two weeks after but that material is written right they're already mad i mean that was that record was happening it's not like oh if we if we get a democrat president again we better pull half these right than that you know what i mean it, the record is what it is um, as this American idiot, but there's songs on there like um, I Want It To Be Wrong, which is basically like a sort of a reads like a a presidential speech almost. It feels like when you when you hear that song, like a really somber presidential speech, there's Final Straw, which is absolutely about the Iraq war. I remember when the war started, they released an early version of that song to a website. Wow. Remember when we did that? And then like... um. It's like, man, you just need to put something out there, whatever, you know, like they, they put it out there early. And, um, you know, so there was like political, it was probably their most political record since document, you know, like actually, you know, cause like, you know, if you remember document has like, you know, exhuming McCarthy, it has like all, all sorts of shit on there. Right. But as a band, they were always about that life, right? Like. Automatic for the people has ignore land, the most savage attack I've heard on Republicans like <laughs> in the 90s. Right. Like, but that's it. People forget. Right. Because you got the night swimming and you got everybody hurts. And people aren't going to people are going to ignore ignore land. That's the way it is sometimes. And I guess that's what happened with American Idiot. Um, going back to Pearl Jam for a second, 
on versus the the first rock record to sell like over a million copies in its first week in the sound scan era one of the most successful rock records of all time smack dab in the middle of that record you have a song called wma i mean you figure out what that you figure out what those initials stand for right so like they were they were about that they weren't like, yeah, we got we have a little of attention. We have a little attention here with 10. We have this mega record. Everyone's going to be paying attention to the next thing. That's a conscious choice to put songs like that on your record. They didn't have to do that. They wanted to do that. So my point is, I guess we don't even have that anymore today, right? We don't even have like I feel like we don't even have like the off hand like fuck Trump song in the middle of our records anymore. Like, you know, like that's, that's the surprising thing. I'm not saying everyone has to be Neil Young and put out a whole record like about it, like living with war, like he did in 2006 at the same fucking time. We can't even get like a, we can't even have an American idiot anymore. Like, I don't, I don't know. It's weird. Maybe we don't need one. I, I don't know. Maybe we have other ways to express ourselves other than music, but I don't know. You know, I, yeah, I think, I think there's a couple points on there. Um, I think one, um, we, we've got a really different distribution system than we had before, you know, where we don't have the same, you know, amplifying factors that really put music in everybody's ear sort of simultaneously. You know, you think about the radio, top 40 radio, you know, you think about even things like, you know, in Remember in my day, you know, we had total requests live, you know, I remember watching oh, yeah. that and, you know, I would literally watch like, you know, uh, you know, corn have, you know, freak on a leash and orgies stitches. And then I'd watch, you know, I'd see like genie in a bottle, you know, shit like that. It would go from one no to scrubs. the other, no scrubs. Right. And yeah. then it'd be, you know, it, I it wanted that sugar. Way. We all know the whatever. hits, right. We can all name them. Bye, mm-hmm. bye, bye. We can mm-hmm. all say them. Anyone mm-hmm. in our age group can do that. You know, you're yeah, right. And, and we had that. And and so if you were watching those shows, you know, you, you might hate corn, but you knew who they were because they were, you know, you wanted to hear your song and that's how a lot of radio worked. Of course there was specialty radio and whatnot, but there's also like the radio that played, you know, the mix of everything. And now people have such a, you know, a nicheified world where like, if I don't want to hear any, you know, hip hop, I don't have to, if I don't want to hear any like hard rock, I don't have to. And so people live very much in their their kind of niche, and so the the ability to impact across is is less, which also means the ability to um, to get that that mass market traction that's going to really drive your revenue. That also seems like that's uh, going to substantially go down as well. So you know, that's got to be a factor, right? Yeah, then that even worked within the genres, right? Because if we were watching MTV jams, we're going to see some goddamn Master P, whether we wanted to or not, right? <laughs> we don't, it doesn't matter. We can wait for we can wait for our, you know, Missy Elliott video all we want. In the meantime, we're going to hear Master P, whether we want to or not. So like, yeah, you're right. Even if you're going to distill it down, like I want to listen to the hard rock station. Guess what? You're still going to hear Creed. Like, too bad. You know, <laughs> like, well, you wait to hear our lady piece Mm -hmm. so like that's just the way it was and that sort of shared experience like we were just talking about trl is gone baby i'm not even saying that it's bad that it's gone you know it's just gone Mm -hmm. so it's it's really different nowadays yeah absolutely and i think in addition to that too kind of kind of jump on a point i think that you were you know kind of uh um teasing here that I think is worth really kind of exploring is that there also are other forms of how we get off on our protest vibes, right? Like I think about a lot of culture that has that protesty feel. A lot of it is movies and teen movies, right? Like I think of the Hunger Games, you know, you're fighting this dystopian oh, government, yeah, right? Yeah. We've got Harry Potter, you know, where Harry Potter, you know, you literally have, you know, in, in your you know, book five, you know, you've got uh, the like order of the Phoenix and whatnot. And you've got this, this wicked professor who's, you know, oppressive and this, you know, basically this sort of wizard Gestapo kind of thing. And you've got wizard Hitler basically. Right. Mm-hmm. So you, you have your protest coming out in these, these sometimes interestingly enough, like sort of young adult movies, these fictional movies, um, your star Wars, obviously, you know, with, 
And in the, the modern versions, you know, you've got the First Order. In your old versions, you've got, you know, the classic Stormtroopers, the Empire, right? The, 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 the same people who freaked out because a black guy might be a Jedi. Oh, my God. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> you don't want that in your imperialist uh, warfare uh, uh, super military movie. No, we can't have that. No politics here, please. Yeah. Brain yeah. off. Leave your brain at the door. <laughs> yes, of course. You know, it, it, all the craziness around that, too. Like, you know, this like, oh, you know, this. It, it's almost like we were we were like a tiny hair away from hearing some like brain dead Republican, like telling us that, you know, they're, you know, that, that, that Finn would have been, you know, an affirmative action Jedi, you know, some, <laughs> some bullshit like that. Right. Like I'm surprised. I mean, we were, we were this close, you know, honestly. yeah, we could have kept him. If they would have kept him as a Jedi or kept that arc, I swear to God, we would have heard it. Oh my God. It would have been great too. It would have been better than what it was, but yeah. whatever. I mean, he didn't, he didn't pass his Jedi tests. Oh you know? no. He, he was handed, he was handed that lightsaber. Oh man. I, <laughs> like, I, yeah. <laughs> he went down to the, to the big office down, downtown that says affirmative action on it with a banner <laughs> half falling off. It used to be a pizza hub and now it says affirmative action, you know, <laughs> under new management, you know, <laughs> and he went down there and got his lightsaber and his, and his pack of marbles. So like, it's just, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, man, the the nine eleven stuff. I know we talked a lot about it, but it's just what a time. I I think about that stuff all the time, and like just some of the craziness. Like, I you know, one of the I I was a big fan of Bush back in the day, and like the the the, the band, not the <laughs> not the not the political family, the band. And uh, remember, they put out that they were coming out that new record. They had that they had that um, single "Speed Kills." Mm-hmm. Uh huh, baby. Can't call it that anymore after nine eleven. They call it, they changed the name to "The People That We Love." There was a lot of stuff like that. But here's the thing, though: what like we can explore every one of these if we wanted to. But like "Speed Kills" is that really gonna like trigger someone's like "Speed Kills"? What does that mean? Okay, yeah. yeah, like the like the Jimmy Eat World Record, Bleed American, obviously was that has their big breakthrough, you know, like it was changed to I guess self titled, right mm-hmm. after after it had after nine eleven, but it was like Bleed American. Okay, I guess that's like, I guess that's more quote unquote explicit about than than Speed Kills, but none of these things are about nine eleven, man. I it was it was such a weird time. Like you're younger than me, so like what what do you really remember about these crazy like? You know what I mean? Like people freaking out over like little yeah. shit. I remember, I remember this cause I was really, I had my eyes on this stuff and I remember I was a huge fan of, uh, of bleed American. I had it. I bought it when it was bleed American. Oh, you uh, actually had bleed yeah. American. Okay. Yeah. I had bleed American. And I remember when that got changed and, uh, you know, I remember Disturbed's, you know, video for prayer, you know, oh, I remember yeah. that people freaked out about that shit. Yeah, that was 2002. A, that was like a full year later. Thing. Yeah. It was weird, huh? Yeah, apocalyptic, you know, music video with, you know, buildings crumbling, you know, falling into, you know, this, you know, buildings and stuff, you know, look very chaotic. I can kind of understand that from a visual imagery standpoint, that kind of makes that that's the one that probably makes the most sense. Um, yeah, but, you but know. even so, I, I think but the, like they're not fucking idiots, though, right? Obviously, they knew what they were making when they made it. So it wasn't like they, you know. Yeah, you know, I I think when it comes to um, Bleed American, uh, you know, and and things like that, um, yeah, I remember, you know, Speed Kills. I think Speed Kills is a perfect example. You know, when I think of that, one of the wonderful parts about music is that you can kind of use it to interpret it as you want. It has enough ambiguity. That's why so many artists, when you ask them about what are your what do your lyrics mean, a lot of them are very hesitant to say what they mean because you know they'll often come back to. Well, it means what it means to me when I wrote it as an artist, but like, I want you to have your meaning. It's right for you, whatever it means to you. So I don't want to force my narrative onto you. If to you, this is a breakup song, then it's a breakup song to you. Even if I was writing it about my dying grandmother, like that kind of a thing. Right. And so, um, when I think of speed kills, I could think of anything from literally like methamphetamine, like speed, like speed kills. I could think of it as like, Hey, if you're driving too fast, if you're being reckless, Right. That recklessness could even apply to drug use, right? Or it could literally yeah. be, you know, it'd be so many different things, right? I don't have to like put that in a box that says like, oh my God, 9-11. So 
it is weird. I also think it's really fascinating to me that, you know, in this era where, you know, we, we, for the last, I don't know, 10 years or so, we've been flooded with this crap about, you know, how triggered people are and snowflakes, liberal Mm -hmm. snowflakes, all this bullshit. Um, how goddamn snowflakey we were post 9-11 with this shit. Oh my shit. god. Like, like there is – one of my favorite examples is um, – and I only know this because um, the station San Diego used to just play it because they probably just thought it was like a good form of protest at that time and it would just go over people's heads. But the Strokes have that song New York City Cops on their debut album. There was a song on there called New York City Cops. That song is about – um. I'm sorry, I always bungle the pronunciation of this, but uh, Amado Diallo, if anyone doesn't know, in 1999, he was it was it was a police, you know, shooting black people situation. Gee, much like we have now, I can't I can't imagine why that hasn't stopped. Anyway, um, he wrote a song about it called New York City Cops. The refrain says New York City Cops, but they're not too smart. Like that's the that's the hook. That was left off. This this record came out in Europe first when we still did that kind of stuff. <laughs> um, it came out like in, in like summer 2001. By the time it came over here, because it came out here after 9-11, they removed New York City cops. But it's about police brutality, man. Like, do, can we just not do people just it's the surface level of it, right? You just see the phrase New York City cops. And it's like, oh, no, it's just yeah. it can't it, attack the boys in blue. You know, it's yeah. it's so fascinating. It, it takes me back to I think of you know, um, some of our big examples that I, I think of, of artists commenting on this, um, you know, we've got, you know, Kurt Cobain, you know, on in bloom, you know, very much, you know, observing, you know, you know, he likes all our pretty songs, likes to sing mm-hmm. along, but he don't know what it means. Right. Mm-hmm. Literally commenting on the fact that you got all, you know, you hit, you know, this, this sort of mass traction and popularity. And then you got all the, like, you know, people that were culturally completely opposite to Kurt Cobain. You get the, the sort of quote unquote, like, you know, jock types who come in, who the, the bros who are all like, yeah, yeah you know, and, and they are missing the point that Kurt Cobain, like was deeply connected to punk music. Um, that was sort of his love, right? Well, or, yeah, but like we all, and uh, yeah, we have those movements, right? We have like the late, like really super extreme, like left wing, like late seventies punk stuff, right? We have like the we have like the late eighties or the nineties, like like I said earlier, like hip hop, right? We have that movement, um, the anti war late sixties, right? We already talked about that, but like, man, I really do think it's the internet taking over. I think it's what you said, and probably other forms of entertainment, like you said, movies, like you said, we're getting those allegories out in Harry Potter or like whatever else, right? Like we are, we are still doing those things. It's just the, I guess the exploration of why it's not in music, but it, that, that, see, that would suggest that music is like not as important culturally or something, which is like, obviously not true because like, look at the top viewed videos on YouTube of all time. It's all music videos. Everything is music videos. Like people always say, oh, I miss MTV. The kids don't. They never had MTV. They just go online and watch all the music videos they want. It's us, you know what I mean, who are used to being fed to it by a by a feed. Here's the next video, right? Here's the next song on the radio. That's a convention for us. And I'm not saying that there's not something still to that. I don't know. Maybe the kids who are watching these music videos don't want to hear, you know, Bush Leaguer or a song like that. Maybe they don't. Maybe they just wouldn't give a shit. I would I would like to bet that they would. We're just not doing it. Yeah, and I, and I think music is definitely important. I think it would be silly to suggest that music is as an irrelevant art form, right? And like it's huge. Music music will always be huge. It's elemental to the human condition. Um, but I think the function of music right now might be a little bit different than it used to be. Um, you know, I think uh, a lot of times it's. Uh, you know, you've got everything that's, you know, music is distraction, like put on your music while you're vacuuming or doing chores or music in between things. And you've got music as like just a thing to kind of get you moving, you know, the, the, the club banger, if you will. Right. Yeah. Um, and I think with the way that we listen to music now, and I, I say we, but I mean, society writ large, uh, a lot of our music listening now is in digestible chunks. It's the, it's the song, you know, it's not the album for a lot of people like these kids Um, I work in a place where I work with a lot of young people who come through 19 year olds, 20 year olds, 
And a lot of the music discovery is through, it is through things like TikTok. There's a lot of artists that are getting broken now through, uh, whether it's TikTok, SoundCloud, YouTube, um, somebody will stumble on this video or they'll, they'll see some goofy TikTok video, you know, that's set to some song and it'll, you know, or a remix of a song or some interpretation of a song. And then that'll take people down these rabbit holes. Um, but, but it's often rare where like, even if somebody stumbles on an old, an old person song, like if they stumble on a sublime song, it's like, Oh, are you familiar with whatever? And it's like, mm-hmm. you know. Like, if, like, you know, if you, they, they might listen to something like they heard of what I got. Okay. They've got what I got or Santeria, but do they know like a deep cut off of, you know, that record? Like, mm-hmm. you know, probably not. Um, Cause they're not, they're not going to, a lot of them aren't going to sit down and actually like, okay, let's, let's take this from the top at track one. Albums yeah. are obviously still important. They're obviously more important than ever because without a physical object, we need that. We need that construction for a body of music more than we ever have. Right. That, that's what that's what I always said about, like, just as an aside, what people said, oh, with the digital age, the album is going to go away. People are just buying this song and that song. And I'm like, no, it's it, it will never go away. That is how we will always format music. And it is true. Right. Like we are we else we are still there. Absolutely. And I think we will be, too. Um, If for nothing else, then I think the artist is going to want to format their work that way. Um, You know, I think about the art that you've done, whether it's, you know, the lists that you've done or whether it's your Mario Maker courses, like anything that you've done that's artistic. I think there's a natural human tendency to want to group things uh, and and make them make sense in a cohesive statement kind of way. So I think artists are going to be drawn to that. And for your true fans, your true blue, like dyed in the wool fans, um, if they really believe in what you're doing and if if it resonates, they're going to want to hear more. And they'll want to hear it in context. Yeah. You're always going to have the people who are, and you know, you think back even to our day, right? There are always going to be the people that were just the singles people. I mm-hmm. know those people all the time. I'd be like, I would nerd out and be like, oh, you like the Smashing Pumpkins? Because you've got a Smashing Pumpkins t-shirt on? Oh, shit. Like, what do you think of Adore? What do you think of this? And they're like, huh? Yeah, or yeah. what's your favorite song on Melancholy? Like, Melancholy? You know what I mean? Like, I like the, 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 the rage song rat in a cage, that song rat in a cage. That's what it's called. Right. <laughs> you know, and me just going, Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> right. So you, we've always had those people. And so I think we're still going to have those people who are just like, Oh, that's a cool song. I like that. I'm putting that on my like sexy time playlist or like my, you know, chores and, you know, angry, you know, drive to work music playlist or whatever. Right. We're always going to have that. But do you, do you really think though, that like, can you imagine, like, I don't know, Imagine Dragons getting out here and making, like, a Trump song? <laughs> Wouldn't that be, like, so laughable? It would oh just be God. incredible. Like, can you, like, what would be the most ridiculous? Like, would it be, like, I don't know. Oh, man, The Weeknd is making some, like. <laughs> the Weeknd? <laughs> I don't know. Oh I don't know. God. Like, what's, what, this would just be absurd, yeah. right? Like, oh, can you, yeah. That would be, that would be really funny. Um. Yeah, I, I I'm trying to think. I think there's some people that I could see that I that that maybe could, but if we're thinking of like goofy people that I think uh, definitely wouldn't. Um, man, like I think in rock we've got a lot of rock now that wouldn't really fit that. Like, no, that's know. the shocking part, right? It's the rock music that won't even do it. It's not even like, yeah. If we think about like you know you know, our hip hop artists, if you think of like Nicki Minaj, like, okay, I can see Nicki Minaj throwing some shit down. Like Cardi B made comments on, on things, right. She's, oh, she's, yeah, sure. she stepped up and, and said things, but, but yeah, our rock artists, I mean, a lot of the rock music now, um, a good chunk of it seems to be uh, like your indie stuff. Or, I mean, you know, like, yeah, the 1975 is not going to be making, you know, this sort of music, <laughs> right. Like, like, they're they're not right or like Bastille or oh my god you know, Red oh. House Painters, <laughs> you know. yeah. Bon, bon Iver is out here yeah. making some like <laughs> right yeah yeah that's we know that's not happening right? I don't know why it... my go to like Dunk is always Bon Iver I have no problem with Bon Iver it's just a really funny thing to like think about I guess I don't know why they're always like my when I need a slam dunk band for like a joke a joke I don't know it's it's always oh funny. yeah. Yeah, that's a good. Um, that, can we please talk about the Clear Channel list? Oh God, a little bit 
for anyone who doesn't know, like after 9-11, there was a bunch of song Clear Channel is the ones who bought up all the radio stations once the once that got deregulated in the 90s. One of the work probably the thing that killed radio f- dead for good. But like there was a list of songs like nobody could play after 9-11 or I don't know if they like actually mandated you can't play them or like strongly suggested against, which means like don't play them or else, which is the same thing anyway. But like one of the funniest ones on here to me is is great balls of fire you can't play <laughs> great balls of fire <laughs> oh my i mean God. like J- john lennon's imagine why not i don't yeah. understand yeah some of these were really nonsensical right like great balls of fire some of it is just it's darkly funny because the idea that anybody's going to associate that with 9-11 it's kind of like you know that that thought experiment right if we're like don't think of an elephant of course you're going to think of an elephant right so Clear Channel telling us, oh, don't don't Great Balls of Fire, don't go there. It's like, I never would have fucking thought Great Balls of Fire and like, you know, Twin Towers and like, you know, Balls of Fire, like Jet Fuel. Like, I wouldn't have gone there. But because they took it there, now we're here. Yeah, now we're here. Why in the world can we not play Local H's Bound to the Floor? Bound for the Floor? Bound to the Floor? Yeah. What? Uh, the, why not? We could not keep it copacetic, apparently. Yeah, uh, well, yeah. It doesn't. But like, the, uh, I'm trying to get in their brain. Is the plane going to the floor? I don't understand. <laughs> like, I, I, I literally, I don't get it. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, yeah oh, like yeah. it doesn't make yeah. any sense. Anything One of with my like, fly, like. Yeah, like anything with fly, right? Like Sugar Ray's fly yeah. or Lenny Kravitz's fly yeah, away. Put your arms around me, baby. Though that's the crazy part. Yeah. It's, like they, it's like they didn't actually listen to the song. Because, like, if you hear fly, like, I just want to fly, put your arms around me, baby. Like, that's not that's not 9-11. I don't think of, like, terrorism <laughs> when I'm, like, giving somebody a hug, you know? That's insane, though. Like, it's just, like, oh, okay, Third Eye Blind's Jumper doesn't make yes. any fucking sense. It's a song about suicide. Now, like, okay, okay, maybe jumping from people jump from the Twin Towers, right? Like, we saw the footage, right? Like, obviously, maybe, maybe that's it. Still, man... People have a brain. It's okay to this is so uh, everything isn't tied to. I don't even know how to. It's just crazy. It, I, it's been twenty years, over twenty years, and I just I still look at this list and it's just oh, I, it's yeah. unbelievable. I think one of my standouts, uh, "Dirty Deeds Done Dirt Cheap." Like, <laughs> what the fuck is that about? Wait a second, that's on here. Yeah, that is on the list. You gotta be kidding. Yeah, me. "Dirty Deeds Done Dirt Cheap." I'm like, that's. You know, you know, obviously I'm thinking like when I hear that, just that title in the song, you know, you know, you know, dirty deeds and the done dirt cheap. I mean, I'm thinking like <laughs> sex work, you know what I mean? Or like just people being kind of like a little slutty, which is great. Like, I mean, more power to the sluts, but like myself included. So, I mean, yeah. Wow. Ooh, you know, I didn't realize this about you. OK, OK, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to I didn't mean to make light of it. Just about like that whole life. <laughs> you, okay, you two Sunday, 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 bloody Sunday. Like I don't understand at all. A song about the the troubles in yeah. Ireland. Not a goddamn thing to do with nine eleven. Because it had uh, blood and uh, th- people died and it says blood, I don't so even we can't think that nine eleven was on a Sunday, right? Yeah, you know, it, was, it was on a Tuesday. Yeah, right. Exactly. I'm like, I, it doesn't even make sense. By um, the way, I forgot to mention. Um, uh, the vinyl version of Is This It came out on 9-11 because it was a Music Tuesday. Now music releases on Fridays. Back then it was a Tuesday. Um, uh, the JC's The Blueprint released on 9-11. There was a lot of records on 9-11. But see, but that's why they took it off of the CD version, uh, New York City Cops, of this Is This It? Because it came out afterwards. The vinyl version came out on 9-11. So that's how we were able to hear New York City Cops. I probably should have mentioned that before. But. That makes sense. Yeah. You know, um, I, I, I'm looking through this list and I'm just like, is this, this is one of those like, is this racist? Yes, no. Okay. Okay. The bangles walk like an Egyptian. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, Why is that on there? Yeah, right? Yo, like, you gotta be kidding me. That yeah. is fucked up. That's fucked up. That's that actually, no, that's up, racist. Right? That's, that's racist. definitely racist. That is fucking racist. Um, one more that I got to say is I, I was going to say Atlantis more sets ironic, but it has that second verse about the plane crashing. Right. So, it's oh, like, OK. 
Yeah, so it's mm, like... Okay. Yeah, but like, still, man, every song doesn't automatically equals nine, equal sign 9-11 now. Like, I think one of my favorite things about this list, though, is the shit that's just like, if you've heard the song, you just know how goddamn tonally inappropriate it is to put this on this list. Perfect example, um, The Gap Band. You dropped a bomb on me. Like, think of how upbeat, like, up tempo. Like, this is a little bop. It's the jam, you're, you're, dude. You're jamming along to this, you know? Like, you dropped a bomb on me, baby. And it's like, that's once again, we're not talking about Iraq here, guys. <laughs> one, one more. I got to say one more before we before we take another break. 311's down. I mean, get out of here, right? Down. Because the plane went down, so we can't play down anymore. <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I, okay, we, we've we had enough fun with this, I think. But um, we're going to take one more break. We'll be back with some a uh, uh, little bit more and maybe a little game. Be right back. no we're back i'm sorry we're back again back once again with the something with my dick out oh my goodness this will get you canceled oh no (laughs) my name is not joe rogan i did not consent to this too bad Man, what is this, Louis C.K.? <laughs> <laughs> we're, um, earlier, we were talking about like we were talking about Nirvana and like macho idiots not getting it. Remember, like sex type thing, yes. like the Stone the Stone Temple Pilot song. Like people oh were like, God. "I'm like, yo, this is a creepy song," but then I'm sure some guys were like, "Yeah, yeah, it's literally a critique of rape culture, right?" Or you think of Nirvana's, you know, like "Rape Me" or you know, mm-hmm. "Polly." Right, mm. you know, like uh, Kurt oh, I didn't Cobain. even think about Polly. Yeah, Kurt Cobain was really pretty, like was really pretty known for being like pretty feminist, you know, mm-hmm. especially for like the time. Um, and so, yeah, it's so so crazy to think about people not really listening, not really paying attention, um, you know, just kind of glomming on to to things and just being like, oh yeah, you know, rate me, you know, or like yeah, yes, they, they, there's thing. no. But that's exactly how the clear channel list starts, right? Because you mm-hmm. just, oh, no, it says rape, so it must be, you know, you know how that goes. Um, but you were, we were talking about something about, like, gatekeepers, because we were talking about, like, you know, social media and, like, you know, the way things get filtered, we can listen to whatever we want. Part of that, though, is, like, gatekeeping, like, I mean, I guess, like, now that's used as a pejorative, right? But in a good way sometimes, because I guess maybe a better term for it is like the curation Mm -hmm. of this thing that you're experiencing. This is alternative rock in 1992 because you heard it on the radio and you read it, you you heard it on MTV, right? Like it was a, it was a thing everyone experienced. Can we all not like also experience what I, I guess I'll put it this way. If someone did come out with like, you know, some like anti Trump records or something. And like, let's say like 2018, we're never, it's never going to hit. Is it with us? Even if it's like, I don't know, pick a band. Let's just say, I don't know. What's a good example. Uh, Well, that's the interesting thing, right? Because you're, you're, you kind of hinted at this. It probably wouldn't be a band anymore. Like it, I, I could see that being much more from hip hop. Like I could see, if like Kendrick Lamar got like really, you know, still was feeling frisky, like I could see him throwing something together or, you know, I don't know. Weirdly, I could see Post Malone if like Post Malone, like, you know, stopped kind of leaning into the party boy, like, let's just like, you know, get chicks and like do drugs kind of a thing. Like, 
I guess I guess Eminem did have that one song, right? Uh, a couple years ago, and all mm-hmm. the and all the and all the Republicans were like, "Well, I'm never listening to Eminem anymore. Let me put my tape deck in the garbage." You know, like it's mm-hmm. just sitting there cartoonishly. It's like you were never listening in the first yeah. place. That's not my Slim Shady. Uh huh. <laughs> the guy who like said uh, other people are getting shot too besides a Columbine like 22 years ago he said that shit in a song and just went mm-hmm. over everybody's head you know what I mean no one gave a shit so besides that we've been playing we've been playing a game with each other I was going to say that's mm-hmm. a really I don't know if I want to put it that way I don't know if I want to put our business out in these streets like yeah. that um <laughs> we Let's like keep it in the closet <laughs> 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 sometimes we like to do a thing where we throw at each other one of us throws at the other a really popular song usually a popular song and we decide whether it's overrated underrated or properly rated it's my favorite thing we do so we're going to do it right now on this podcast so you give me a song i don't know what they are we didn't talk about these beforehand. You're just going to hit me with one, and I'm going to come up with my live reaction. Overrated, underrated, properly rated. Go ahead. All right. First on deck. All I want to do is make love to you by heart. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. That one. I haven't thought about that one in a while. Every time I think about it, I think about the content of the song. It's about this chick who just like wants to shack up with a dude so she can get knocked up. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a I didn't really think it. Well, that's what I'm going to say. I didn't really think about it that way because I haven't really heard that in my like true adult life. Right. Like, obviously, I know the song. I'm going to say that's properly rated. I feel like that's one in their catalog that gets, you know, it's not these dreams or something. Right. But I mean, it gets it gets its fair share of play. It's it's a pretty decent song. It's not like one of my favorites. I I think it is properly rated. Personally. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't Would think there's so? more accolades. Um but it it definitely like if you've got a I I I don't I haven't checked this, right? But if, if there's a I'm sure there's a greatest hits or maybe a couple greatest hits heart records and uh yeah, it's not going to be it's not Barracuda, but it's definitely it's up there. It's going to make the greatest hits record. Oh yeah, that's a, that's a shoe win. It's not like you know some other one where it's like, eh, you know, maybe a disc two if you buy the special <laughs> edition, right? Like it, it's it's on there. It's on there for sure. Beautiful. Um, okay, so I want to throw one at you. How about Squeeze? Tempted. Ooh. Tempted by the fruit of another. Squeeze over under proper tempted man i gotta go with underrated here um that's surprising I, okay i think it's underrated i i think that um I, you know well i don't know i guess i guess i would say underrated because i think that uh it's it's got a good chorus but i don't know how i feel like maybe maybe it should have gotten a little more attention than it did yeah i feel like it was one of those songs that sort of like made its way around the country when that could still happen in like different intervals. I don't think it charted very high is the thing. So everyone's heard it, but obviously we were not bored in 1981. So I can never say like, you know, Oh yeah. My station was jamming that back in the day. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's tough. Right. But I feel like it's gained enough of a cult following at this point to be able to say that I think it is properly rated. Maybe like, in the 80s and 90s, it wasn't quite there. Yeah. But I there feel we go. like it is there now. Because I'm sure it's going to like make some rotations on some like, you know, Muzak. Like if you go into, I don't know, if you go into Coles or whatever, I'm sure at some certain times you might run into this song, you know? Uh, yeah. It charted 41 in the UK, 45 in Canada, 49 in the US. So not even really like a top 40 hit. In the UK, they do like top 30 hit. That's like their line of demarcation. So it didn't even do that. So, you know, but it, maybe it's again, it's just one of those songs like um, like Bizarre Love Triangle, the New Order song. I think it charted like 56, you know, and wow. I'm surprised it even got that high. And that's one of the most well-known songs mm-hmm. of the 80s now. And look, and when I was a kid, I remember hearing it. But 
maybe other stations didn't play. You never know, right? So I feel like anyway, I feel like I feel like Tempted is like now properly rated. Yeah, okay, that's fair. You know, when you're talking about different countries and their charts, I always wonder with shit like this, the the data nerd in me always wonders, like, what does this look like in, like, Mexico or Japan, you know, like, random ass countries? Um, Because you never know. Like, there's times where, you know, all of a sudden you have a band that just sort of like, eh, this kind of was a a flash in the pan in America, but goddamn, did the Japanese love the shit out of this? Mm -hmm. Or, or like Mexico just lost their minds at this song. You're like, Mexico? Like, right. Yeah. Why was this resonating in Mexico city or whatever? Yeah. It's really fun to look at that stuff with like pop artists, right? Like a, a Madonna song that charted like, you know, 37 here was like a number two in Australia or something. It's like, okay, I guess. Or, you know, it's, it's really fun to see that stuff. I love looking at that kind of data myself. Um, speaking of Madonna, let's go to one. Okay, I got one for you. Ooh. Okay, you know what? Let's play. Let's play a game within the game. Guess which Madonna song I'm about to throw to you. If you can get this, I'll like fall off the chair. No, I won't. Okay. Um, I'm thinking "Beautiful Stranger." No, you're 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 almost you're in the right era. Frozen. Uh... Madonna. Overrated, underrated, properly rated, frozen. Ooh. I think I'm going to say properly rated on that. I think I will as well. I think that's properly rated. Do you think that, like, the reason why I might even tend towards underrated a little bit, because, like, as a lead single, I feel like it doesn't really get that kind of respect, like a like a secret Mm, or a mm -hmm. like you know what i mean like i I feel like it doesn't get that like or a live to tell i mean it's not as good as live to tell obviously i'm just saying that like it doesn't get that like same top billing even though it was popular and it was played you know what i mean like it's not like it was a flop or anything it's just that i feel like it doesn't like hit people like those other ones maybe Mm because it's kind of like yeah i think airy and kind of light or like not like the most upbeat song maybe it's like kind of yeah i think that's uh that's definitely a part of that um okay. yeah okay so we're going with uh underrated on that or yeah, maybe slightly underrated. I'll, I'll no i'll say properly rated i just don't i this i was just saying that's the only way i might tend towards underrated but i will say properly rated you know it's it, it is funny when you bring it up i i think that uh um when we talk about that you know, we, it's easy. It is easy for me to forget that that was in fact a lead single. Um, yeah. I think when I think of Ray of Light, I think of the the title track probably first yeah. and foremost. I mean, I think it was the most popular song. Shit. I even think of uh, uh, the power of goodbye. Mm-hmm. I think of, I love that song. I think of like, but I don't know. Frozen just sort of gets, I don't want to say forgotten about. I don't think that's true, but it doesn't get the, it doesn't get the billing of the others. I remember that music video for Ray of Light, though. That was really cool. I remember her doing her little, like, you know, thing. It, like it was pretty wild. I think, I think the Frozen video was cool, too. It has that, like, um, blue tone. I always yeah. like when the 90s did that. You know, like, usually it's reserved for, like, a, I don't know, a Jodeci video or something. But, like, I, <laughs> I liked when uh, I liked when other people did it. By other people, I mean white. Okay, give me another, <laughs> give me another the song. The Whites. Okay. The Whites. Well, let's do, speaking of The Whites... Thunder Kiss 65, White Zombie. Thunder Kiss 65. <sighs> Man, Kevin, I'm sorry, my co host on the regular show. <laughs> I think the song is overrated. Oh. I do. I'm sorry. I just, I, look, I think it's fine. I used to not like the song at all. I remember when I first heard it, I was like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> You know, like I just, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't into it, but now I've grown more to appreciate it. I don't hate it anymore, but I'm sorry. It's overrated, especially when it comes to that era of white zombie. Mm -hmm. I would definitely take a lot more over that. Mm -hmm. I I think, I think more human than human is like one of the best songs of the nineties, right? Yes. That song's fucking incredible. That song is fucking perfect. Like it's got that wonderful, like electronic beat like intro and then it drops and it's just like it's got that slap and bass line oh my like, god 
Like, More there's a lot of great, is. great shit on that. The, the, I'm, yeah, I'm sorry. Thunder Kiss 65 is... It's I, right? I like, would I, I just... Uh. It's fun to me. It's fun in retrospect. I do like it more now than I did back then. And it didn't hate it back then. It was like, this is, this is, it's like, okay, this is fine. Um, but, and now I'm just kind of like, yeah, this is kind of a bop, you know, yeah. like it has its moments, but okay. Um, okay. I got one for you. It's a song we've spoofed 1400 times. Cause it's infinitely spoofable. I want to ask you about Devo's whip it. Oh, yeah. Overrated, <laughs> underrated, properly rated. No, we cannot do our multiple spoofs that we do because they are not fit for these airwaves. <laughs> uh, oh God, we've spoofed that so hard. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Um. Man, I'm gonna say I'm, I'm. I don't know. Maybe this is. I don't. I feel like this would be non-controversial for Devo people, but maybe controversial for radio people. I'm gonna say a bit overrated. Um, I agree. It's it, so it's it's hugely important, obviously, as as like one of the songs that Devo's most known for. Um, you know, huge song of the time, right? So in that sense, it's very very important. Um, relative to you know Devo's catalog, though, you know you've got other songs that are, you know, that it it, it sort of inadvertently overshadows a lot of things. So I think it can be scaled yeah. back a little bit. I mean, look, and it overshadows that record, which had other hits. Uh, my favorite record, my favorite record, my favorite song on there is Gates of Steel. I love Gates of Steel. I named a Mario Maker 2 course Gates of Steel. It is my most popular Mario Maker 2 course. It has my most plays. Thank you, Devo. Um, I think I think that's a good album. I think with Yeah, sure. It's overrated. Right. Like, I think they have other better material on that album and before that and after that. So, you know, yeah. sure. But I don't think it's bad. I don't think it's like overrated. Like, man, I just don't get why people like this. It's obviously no. it's a very likable song, especially. I think it's pretty genius for 1980, right? Because you mm-hmm. had, you got that like new wave slap to it. You have that like very cold synthesizer sound. It's appealing, right? It's just very lightweight. So oh, it's yeah. just kind of. Eh. Right. It's got such a catchy fucking like riff too. like, God damn. Yeah, you can't forget it. Right. But no. that's kind of all it has. Right. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, yeah. It, um, it's not freedom of choice. So, no, no. Anyway, or it's not Gates of Steel, if you ask me. So beautiful. All, all right. right. Want to do up. one more piece? Um, we'll see how it goes. We'll, we'll see. Oh, OK. OK. You ready? <laughs> you ready, bitch? You ready? You ready? <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Next up, in the blue corner, Mr. Brightside by The Killers. Overrated. Ooh, okay. Over. Uh, look, man, I actually like this song. I'm not. Mm-hmm. I'm not trying to dunk on it or anything. It's a really good song. Um. Hey, Evan. Uh, you, you ever hear of a band called Duran Duran? I'm kind of a big <laughs> fan of them. Like. <laughs> <laughs> you see where I'm going with this. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry, man. It's just it's too much of a rip for me to really say it's like a great song. I can't. I'm sorry. I a pastiche is a is a technique handed down from musician to musician from generations, right? And that's fine. You can do a Duran Duran song. I just think this one's just kind of a little too wink wink nod nod. It's fine though. I actually do like Mr. Brightside. Okay. It's a good yeah. song. I just think it's overrated. That's all. Yeah, I do. I like it too. Um, I and it is Duran Duran. I mean, I think uh, Brandon Flowers absolutely wanted to be Simon Le Bon uh, oh real my bad, God. <laughs> um, especially on that record. I, later, you know, on you know Sam's Town or whatever, he really wants to be like Bruce Springsteen, and that's cool too. Right. But he was know, Simon Le Bon on Hot Fuss. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Um, so 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 much so much simon Lebon, but uh yeah i um it's interesting i feel like this song has gotten a lot of uh resurgence you know recently or somewhat of a resurgence with you know folks that are even slightly younger than i am i've seen it like pop up in memes and i've seen it sort of referenced a little bit more it seems to be a song that people remember fondly um but perhaps maybe even a little more fondly um 
than it deserves, especially for that record. That record has way better songs on it. Um, what was that first hit they had? Somebody told me. Yeah, I yeah, think? yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's way better than Mr. Brightside. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, I love Mr. Brightside. I personally love it, but um, but then you know, and then of course, I feel like there's deep tracks that just blow all of that out of the water. Like me I, too. I, I think "Smile Like You Mean It" just wrecks all of that. Or on top. Yeah, on top. Yeah, that's the song I was thinking of. Yeah, it was like there's a song smack dab in the middle of that record that I love, and it's it's on top. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's been so long since I listened to Hot Fuss. So, yeah, thank you for that. God, I gotta go. I gotta go through that in the title uh, queue. God, on top. I remember mm-hmm. that one. Actually, we should make a playlist after this is over. We'll make a playlist for the people. Here are all the songs we talked about, just in case you don't know them. Um, okay, this is a song I already know you love and I love. It's one of our favorite songs of the '80s, but mm-hmm. that doesn't necessarily mean that we can't judge it accordingly, right? So I want to ask you about Eddie Money's Take Me Home Tonight. Over, Ooh. under, proper. Ooh. Um, Take Me Home Tonight. Damn, that's a good one, too. I don't want to let you out to you show me your headlights, if you know what I mean. <laughs> you know what I mean. Wow. Yeah. Um, sir, that is sexist. No. And we are now reporting this to the federal. We, we went on a date and I bought her dinner. Okay, well, I guess that makes you a. Uh, you're, I feel like you sound like the the character of the guy who'd wear like the that fucking shirt that's like FBI, like female body inspector. Oh or my whatever. god, like, yeah, you're that guy. Or yeah. or his uh, his cousin from the '90s, uh, the guy who'd wear like the big dog shirt. Oh lord, people still wear those big dog shirts. Oh man. fuck, yeah. That's, I like think that boomers. must be, that must just be a Nevada thing, right? Like, no, so. I think like I no, dude, you're telling me some like aging Gen Xer in Iowa, like who's like 54 years old. The, the, come on. They're they mm-hmm. wearing a big dog shirt, right? Are they listening to Eddie Money's Take Me Home Tonight? Um, mm. I hope so, because I think that song is great. I really do. Um, you know, we've got the the awesome little like Ronettes nod there. Yeah, we got that. Yeah. It's, uh, it's she great. died recently, huh? Like a couple yeah, months ago. She sure did. Yeah. Ronnie Spector. Yeah. That was recent. Yeah. Um, Peter Buck loved the Ronettes a lot, actually, if you can, I mean, I'm sure you can believe that, but. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. You know, hugely important. Um, you know, be my baby. I mean that, that drum riff, I've had some conversations about that. That drum riff is so iconic, like fucking everybody ripped it off. You know, you know, you have meatloaf, you know, ripping it off. Um, you know, you, you know, for like, you know, you took the words right out of my mouth. You know, you've got, uh, you know, the, the Frankie Valley and the Four Seasons uh, ripped it off, too. I mean, I, everybody ripped off that that beat. So, yeah. you know, hugely important. I love how, you know, we brought it back for Take Me Home Tonight. Man, I'm going to say, I'm going to say that, that that song gets a lot of love. Uh, you know, I, I'm going to say that that's properly rated. I don't think it should be even bigger because I think it is pretty big especially in Eddie Eddie's catalog. I think people think of that before they think of two tickets to paradise or yeah. before they think of like, I feel like that's the song now. It is. Yeah. Even you know? more than ways, I love the rainy nights or whatever. Like it's take me home tonight. It now. is. You know, yeah. I feel and like, I think that's how it should be. You want to do an experiment? I'm going to load title right now. I'll load Eddie money's page. Do you think take me home tonight? is like the top, Listen to song. I sure hope so. It's okay. gotta be right. Okay, let's see right now. It's take me home tonight. Yep. Okay. Good. Good. Yeah, I, I figured it was because, like, you know, it it's gotta be. So personally, just just my opinion, I I would say it's slightly underrated because, like, yes, it's a big hit. Everyone knows it. It's his most well known song now. I really, like I said, I think it's one of the best songs of the 1980s. I absolutely believe that. And I feel like it's just not thought of it that way. And maybe, maybe it should, maybe it shouldn't. I really think it's great. Give me one. It's your turn. Uh, Jack and Diane from John Cougar Mellencamp. Or Excellent Johnny song. Cougar or Excellent John song. Mellencamp. 
<laughs> you go, you're gonna do all the all the permutations. All the, yeah, yeah, all of his different iterations. I love that he had those different phases, though. Yeah, I like the I like when he was in between and he was John Cougar Mellencamp. Mm-hmm. That was like the 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 um. This is a great song. It's an excellent song. I'll say that. Because he is an excellent songwriter. I actually dunked on him the other day on Twitter because I was saying the five worst songs of the 1980s. And I said, R.O.C.K. in the USA is fucking horrid. <laughs> that song fucking sucks. It does. Yeah. It's like that's we built awful. the city on rock and roll. You know, it's oh, you know, get, well, that's the worst song of the 80s. But like, I just thought it was so beneath him. Like Stevie Wonder's like, I just called to say I love you. Like, it's just so beneath the songwriter mm-hmm. that it just makes me mad to hear it. I'm like. I can't believe you would write this. Jack and Diane is properly rated. I think. I don't know how it charted, but like, I really, I, I'm sure it was like a top 10 hit or whatever. I think that song is fucking incredible. It's mm-hmm. one of the most, it's one of the best rock riffs of all time. Right? Like, I think, I think people recognize it as such. I'm going to say properly rated. Yeah. And you've got the, you have the drum breakdown. Right. Oh my god! <laughs> um, which which I I remember reading. Uh, interestingly enough, um, I don't know if it was through like I don't know how I, I saw this or stumbled upon this, but uh, Kerry Kenny uh, Aronoff. I don't know if that's how you say his name, but really famous touring drummer. Um, he toured with uh, the Smashing Pumpkins when uh, you know Jimmy Chamberlain got booted out of the band, and then they uh, were touring on a door. Um, Kenny Aronoff toured with them. And he also, he's, he's just a huge studio musician, studio drummer, touring drummer, um, still kind of a legend in drumming. And he did that riff uh, and made like nothing out of it, basically. Like he didn't get shit out of it. And it's kind of an interesting story about how like, you know, sometimes you are the guy who creates the iconic riff. Mm-hmm. And, you you know, if you're not smart about, you know, you know the publishing or getting a writing credit, um, you can just totally get hosed. And so, you know, that famous like, you know. Da, 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 you know, it's incredible. You know, that whole it's thing, so it's good. I didn't even think about that riff. part. I mean, yeah, I I, I love it when I hear it, right? But it's yeah. just like I don't. It's not something that's like the forefront. But when it comes on, it's like yeah, you know what you, I mean. You got yes. an air drum to that, right? Just yeah. like Phil Collins in the air tonight. Like there's a few of these iconic um, controversial opinion. Jack and Diane drum break is better than in the air tonight. I'm sorry, <laughs> bringing the heat on this. Yeah, shit. I'm okay. sorry. It is. It's better. Sorry, oh. everybody. Ooh, that's, I'm going to, I'm going to have to like ask, I'm going to have to ask a group this. I'm going to have to pull the audience and, you know, pull an audience. No, I'm always, I always get fucked if never that happens. <laughs> like, we should put this on Twitter. <laughs> like we should start, we should put this out on social media and ask. I don't know if I just ask people on the street, hey, that drum riff in Jack and Diane, do you, you bring that to front of mind? Well, I wouldn't have thought about it unless you, you know what I mean? But I obviously know it once you said it, but it's not mm-hmm. like something I'm just going to. You know, yes, okay. In the air tonight has that going for it, but you know, fuck it, it. does. <laughs> but in terms of technical quality, though, you probably got to give it to to Kenny over Phil Collins on that. Yeah, and I love Phil Collins sure. as a drummer, but I think Kenny takes it on this one. Um, well, we've reached the end of our musical journey. We can never listen to music again. Yeah, delete your title it, app. Folks. Delete your Apple Music app. <laughs> that's all, folks. Uh, thanks for joining me. Yeah, I feel like now we got to throw in like a needle off the record sound effect. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have that. I don't have any sound effects for the show. I only have music. I gotta get a. I gotta get a library of sound. Yeah, to throw it in post. So yeah. like whenever somebody says something sexy, I can put a boing, like a yeah, spring yeah. sound or whatever. Put a ooga, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like the wolf. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, uh, thank you, Evan, for joining me. Uh, Go to Fine Time Podcast, guys, like usual. You can follow us. Thanks for joining us. See you later. Bye. Just remember, when in doubt, just whip it out. What? Whip out what? I said, when in doubt, just whip it out.
your penis.